we have the word experimental on the side of this. What does that really mean? We do, and you know, on this particular gyroplane, there's not a lot of places where you can put that word, so they put it right on one of their gear legs here. Well, it's a gyroplane. Now, they have to be an experimental today. They are part of the light sport aircraft group, but FAA has let's say been slow to make the final approvals for these they are working on it but they cannot currently today make an SLSA version of this which means they can't make an ELSA version of it so it has to be an EAB okay now are we confused yet or what let's start again <laughs> even I'm confused and I know quite a bit about this that's true so we got a lot of letters there but of course they're a mouthful and that's why we use an abbreviation just to say it a little quicker but here's what those mean EAB, first of all, that's what this is. This is an experimental, and the AB means amateur built. There are other kinds of experimental. There is experimental exhibition, which might be an aerobatic aircraft. Uh, there is experimental for sales and marketing while a company tests out a new model that they want to make. So there are some other categories, but overwhelmingly, when people think experimental, this is what they mean. Something that the owner himself built and under the conventional rules for EAV or experimental amateur built, the owner must build 51% of this. He can buy the rotor blades already done. I don't know that he did on this aircraft, but that's the kind of thing you can, you can buy some of the component parts, you can buy the engine, or you can build the engine. You, the point is you have to do 51% of the total work effort yourself, and FAA's got a lengthy sheet that they go through to several sheets that they go through to make sure that it actually meets the 51% rule. There is actually nothing called the 51% rule, it's the experimental amateur built rule, but that's the shorthand for it. Now, in that list, is there a list then of aircraft that are approved that you could go to and say, okay, I'm gonna build this airplane, or can you just basically start from scratch and build an airplane and then expect it to be in the 51% rule? Well, the, the, the whole reason why the 51% comes into play in the first place is because there are companies that make kits, and so they do some of the hard work for you. In fact, they do their very hardest parts for you, but since they're a company and can do them efficiently, in theory, it doesn't take them as much time as it would take you. So when you add the finished work and all the assembly and the rest of it, that's how you get up to 51%. As to the first question, yes. Uh, I would direct everybody to go to EAA.org and or call EAA or become a member of EAA ideally and then you can get all the information in the world from that organization about which aircraft are approved and how you go about that and is there someone who can help you do this thing and yes to all of those questions EAA's got a lot of answers about it. That's really their world. The EAA does a lot of things with experimental, experimental amateur built is their home. But then we talked about these other two things, the other couple of mouthful of letters, ELSA and SLSA. Currently a gyroplane like this aircraft here cannot be an SLSA, we said that. But all the other aircraft out here at the Midwest LSA Expo are light sport aircraft and overwhelmingly they are special light sport aircraft. That means that they're fully built. They're special because they're built by a factory, completely done. You're, you pay your money, you get some keys, you get your owner's manual and your pilot's operating handbook and some other stuff, you turn it on and you fly away after you've had a checkout from them. But there's more to it than that because once a company has built and gotten approved an SLSA or a special light sport aircraft or a fully built aircraft, all the same thing, then they have permission to build an ELSA which is an experimental light sport aircraft. Not this kind of experimental where you do 51% of the work and that may take a few hundred hours or a few thousand hours, so it can be a big job. An ELSA doesn't have to meet any percentage at all. The company has to have at least one SLSA that got approved, then they can make a kit. And that kit could be as simple as adding just a few parts to it, which wouldn't save you much, but you could then have some other privileges with it. Um, or they could have it be a 10% kit, and you have to do a great deal of work on it. It's whatever they would choose to market and sell. But when you have done an ELSA, you are now the builder of it. Now, you have to do the first ELSA exactly, bolt for bolt, identical to the SLSA version. Get your airworthiness certificate from a designated uh, airworthiness inspector, representative, a DAR it's sometimes called, and then having gotten that certificate you can start making changes and you can do all kinds of things and you can do the maintenance and other stuff with training and that's the beauty of that program but 
an experimental aircraft, uh, light sport aircraft or an ELSA cannot be used for flight instruction for hire or rental for hire. That's the province of only the special light sport aircraft. So once again, our three categories of any of these kinds of small aircraft, we're looking at a gyroplane right here, but you can have an experimental amateur built or EAB, you can have a special light sport aircraft or an SLSA, or if they have the former, then you can have an ELSA or experimental light sport aircraft. Now, we talked about the EAA and having a list of approved aircraft under the experimental category. Is there an approved list or a website that we can go to where we can get a list of the special light sport aircraft that are out there? There is. As a matter of fact, uh, near and dear to my heart, my own website uh, has uh, sort of made it a focus to have something we call the SLSA list. And this has become quite widely used now. It's even used by FAA registration branch. When they get a new registration for an aircraft they're not too familiar with, they will often go look on that list, I'm told, and use it as a reference to make sure they've got the right company names and the right, right model named. Because with more than 80 manufacturers and 120 different models of aircraft, it's pretty tough for all those folks to keep up with all the new airplane, all airplanes and brands that have come along. The SLSA list is available on buydanjohnson.com. Chris Collins coming to you from the 11th annual Midwest LSA Expo. Can't believe it's been 11 years. We've done it for a decade and starting our second, but we're really excited about it. And uh, this year we've got good weather. Uh, a lot of attendees from all across the nation that are here looking at airplanes. A lot of exhibitors from all across the country and Europe and uh, all over. And we're having a really good time. And uh, many people ask me, What's the big deal about this expo? What's it about? How does it work? Well, it's highlighting light sport aviation, which is a small segment of aviation, which allows people to get into aviation more affordably. The airplanes are smaller. They have two seats, and they only fly at daytime. And you could go from uh, Part 103 ultralight gyroplane up to short takeoff and land, and also a, what we call a high performance type of LSA where you could go 120 miles an hour and throw bags in the back and travel somewhere. So it's all dependent on what the, what the individual pilot wants to use the aircraft for, either for fun or for traveling. And the, the segment fills all that and all of those planes are represented here at Mount Vernon. And so that's what we're doing is we're, we're offering the industry a place where comparison shopping happens and comparison flying. So someone could come in here from, and we have an attendee here from Colorado, one from California, and they've come to test fly all the different models and make an informed choice by being able to see the competition. Hi, I'm Greg Greminger. I'm the uh, Magni uh, gyroplane dealer in the central part of the uh, U.S. here. I'm at the Mount Vernon LSA Expo. I've been at the LSA Expo for 11 uh, years ever since they started so I'm kind of a traditional guy here uh, we like to bring the gyro one because it it does attract uh, uh, people especially local people uh, typically strange enough with all the airplanes here the first picture in the local papers is of the gyro but then that helps get people out here and it brings business to to everybody hi my name is Bill Canino I'm with Sport Air USA out of North Little Rock Arkansas we're here at the air show that we enjoy going to. We go to a lot of air shows every year. Some of them are big, some of them are small, but we go to a lot of them. At this place, we're treated like family. The community is behind this air show. Chris, the guy that runs the place, has got a pile of volunteers. Even members of his own board are here volunteering. You can find them in the yellow shirts. If you need something, they solve a problem. We go to a lot of air shows and sometimes 
the cost of the show is astronomical and the returns are very little. What we found is that the smaller air shows with a smaller venue actually do better for us. Right here, we have been able to sell a plane, take another proposal on one, and take home about good 12 good prospects. Even though attendance may not be good, the quality of the people that we're seeing is the kind of place that we want to go to. I'd invite you to come next year. I've been here for every year it's been in, in existence and intend to be. I've already reserved my spot next year. So come back and join us.